What's up, Night Owl? Still here back with another Rhyme of the Frost Main video, and today we're going over Chapter 4, Destruction's Light. This chapter may seem complicated at first, but it's actually pretty simple. All you really have to do as a DM is to keep track of where that dragon's at over, over the timeline of it destroying Ten Towns, and when the party decides, to, and keeping track of the party's movement and the amount of time it takes them. So it's just, it's just knowing how long things take between uh, how long it takes the party to move from one place to another and what time it is as far as where the dragon is. And I'll go over all that in this video and make it really easy for you. But first, let's talk about Valen Harple. When your party leaves Sunblight, they're going to run into Valen and her sled dogs and her kobolds. Valen is a member of the Arcane Brotherhood, and her mission is to find the lost city of Netheril that crashed in somewhere here in Icewind Dale. She is actually here looking for the party specifically because she's heard about their deeds throughout chapter one and two, and she wants to ask for their help to find a, a couple of components that she believes she needs in order to find the city. And this, this NPC is what's going to propel the characters through the next few chapters, or the last few chapters, rather, of the campaign. But first, that dragon needs to be dealt with. And while she doesn't necessarily care what happens to Ten Towns, she does understand that if she helps the party, then maybe they'll be more likely to help her. And it's because of this that she offers the party a ride back to Ten Towns so they can get there quicker and deal with that dragon. Now for what I believe is the hardest part about running this chapter, and that is the timeline between the dragon leaving Sunblight and then returning to Sunblight and all that destruction of the Ten Towns in the middle of it. The chart in the book does not help that much because it only gives you the flight times. It does not count for the amount of time the dragon actually spends in the town destroying things. Those, those times are listed in the individual town blocks in this chapter, which I will go, I'll go over all that uh, in a moment. But I want to be clear. I'm going to say this again. The times listed in this chapter for the dragon are the times that it takes it to get from one place to another not the amount of time it takes to actually destroy the town. You're going to have to add all those up. Or you might not because this video, I'm going to give you an actual chart with the timeline, and I'm going to spell it all out for you. Now, in order to simplify things for this video, I'm going to say that the dragon is leaving Sunblight at noon. You can feel free to adjust these times, whatever makes sense for you and however you want these events to play out. I'm just for the purposes of this video so you guys can keep track of the timeline easier. Noon is when the dragon is leaving Sunblight, and we're going to go from there. So the dragon leaves Sunblight at noon, and it takes two hours to reach Dugan's Hole. It is now 1400. It takes 30 minutes for the dragon to destroy Dugan's Hole. It is now 1430 as the dragon leaves. It takes another 30 minutes for the dragon to arrive at Goodmead. It is now 1500. It takes the dragon one hour to destroy Goodmead. It is now 1600. The dragon leaves Goodmead and heads for East Haven. This is a one and a half hour trip. It is now 1730. It takes the dragon eight hours to destroy East Haven. It is now 1.30 in the morning of the second day. The dragon leaves East Haven and heads for Cairdenaval. That trip lasts one hour. It is now 2.30 in the morning. Cairdenaval is destroyed in an hour. It is now 3.30 in the morning. The dragon leaves Cairdenaval and heads for Cair Koenig. This trip takes an hour. It is now 4.30 in the morning. Karakonik falls in one and a half hours. It is now 6 in the morning. The dragon leaves Karakonik and heads for Tourmaline. That trip takes two hours. It is now 8 o'clock in the morning. Tourmaline is destroyed in six hours. It is now 1,400. The dragon leaves Tourmaline and heads for Lonelywood. This trip takes 30 minutes. It is now 1,430. The dragon spends two hours destroying Lonelywood before it leaves. It is now 1,630. The trip from Lonelywood to Bremen is one and a half hours. The dragon arrives at 1800. The dragon spends two hours destroying Bremen and leaves at 2000. The trip from Bremen to Targos is 30 minutes. It is now 2030. It takes eight hours for the dragon to destroy Targos. It is now 430 in the morning of the third day. The trip to Bryn Shander takes 30 minutes. It's now five in the morning. The dragon spends six hours carpet bombing Bryn Shander before it lands. It is now 1100. The dragon spends six hours on the ground sweeping for survivors before it leaves Bryn Shander. It is now 1700. The trip from Bryn Shander to Sunblight takes three and a half hours. It is now 
2030. With all that being said, there's no hope for Dugan's Hole or Goodmead short of being able to teleport there. The party just can't get there fast enough. If the party leaves Sunblight immediately after the dragon leaves, it is possible that they could reach East Haven in time to save at least some of it. But realistically, East Haven will probably be destroyed as well, just depending on how fast the party can get there. And let's go over that real quick. And remember, Valen will offer the party her dog sleds, so the party will be moving at one mile an hour, at least according to Overland Travel in the book. This makes the math really simple. Dugan's Hole is 10 miles from Sunblight, so the party can get there in 10 hours. East Haven is 12 miles from Sunblight, so the party can get there in 12 hours. This does not account for any kind of mountain travel, which they move at half speed. And this also doesn't account for the amount of time the party spends from leaving Sunblight to meeting Valin. So that's entirely up to you how much time they spend in the mountains, moving at half of their normal speed, and how much time it takes them to reach, or how much time it takes Valin and the party to meet before they can move with the dog sleds. So all of that is up in the air. Absolute base, if the party has axe beaks or dog sleds and they are moving at the fastest possible speed, ignoring mountains, they can reach Dugan's Hole in 10 hours, East Haven in 12, which means that they can reach East Haven in time to at least partially save it because the, the dragon's going to spend about eight hours there plus travel. The not-so-fun part is factoring up the amount of time the party spends in Sunblight if they decide to do that first, in which case I would personally just add up the amount of short rest they take, because those are hours, and the amount of rituals they cast. Some of, so your wizard's probably going to do a detect magic or an identify. All of these rituals take 10 minutes. So factor those in, add up their rituals, add up their short rest. It, the amount of time they spend moving between rooms and com combat happens really fast. Moving between rooms and searching them, that's really fast. You can just add an hour, maybe even 30 minutes to the to the end time. The big things that you want to track while the party is inside Sunblight is the short rest, which are an hour, long rest, which are eight, and uh, any rituals they cast, which are 10 minutes. One quick note about the weather. The book says that when the dragon leaves Tourmaline, a strong storm picks up over 10 towns, and it remains there for the next 24 hours. So for the duration of this dragon attack. And this happens as the dragon's leaving Tourmaline, which by our example would be about 1,400 on the day after the dragon leaves Sunblight. So from then on, uh, Lonely Wood, Bremen, Targos, and Bryn Shander, there will be a storm going on while the dragon is attacking. And you can add a nice little dramatic effect. You got those the lightning off in the distance and that rolling thunder for really dramatic effects. You can do you can kind of spice it up a bit there. Have some fun with that one. The rest of this video is going to be about how to run a dragon. And if ever there was a creature whose stat block needed to be read before you sit down at the table and run it, it's a dragon. First, let's talk about that breath weapon, and more specifically, recharge. You need to understand how recharge works. This dragon has a recharge 5 and 6, which means at the start of each of this dragon's turns, if it does not have its breath weapon, it's going. you're going to roll a d6, and on a 5 or a 6, the dragon gets its breath weapon back. And there's a reason that a dragon's breath weapon is the most iconic thing about the dragons. It is terrifying. It is scary, in and out of character. When you roll that D6 to see if the dragon gets its breath weapon back, all of your players' booties should pucker up in terror as they watch that, that D6 roll across the table. When a dragon has its breath weapon, that is going to be its priority. Regardless of opportunity attacks, it is going to reposition itself to get the maximum effect out of its breath. The big difference between this dragon and your typical dragon is that this is a construct. It was built, it was programmed, it has a purpose. It's like the Terminator. It's going to roll in, it's going to do what it was created to do, and then it's going to back out. It is not like a regular dragon. It's not a red or a black dragon. It's not, it doesn't have a personality. It's not going to, it doesn't have an ego. It doesn't have pride or anything like that. It, it has one track and it's going to follow it in the most logical way possible. If it gets surrounded, it's going to back off. If it sees a threat that it can isolate, it's going to multi-attack that thing to the dust. How you run this dragon is really important because these are, these are very, this is an epic encounter. And I've seen too many DMs just ruin dragons because they didn't know how to run them properly. So you got to pay attention, read that stat block, understand what it can do. 
It has magic resistance. It's going to have advantage on saves. It has immutable form. Its form can't be altered. The malevolent presence is simple. It's going to fire that off. And if you save, you save, you pass, you pass. It doesn't need to, to use it again further, except maybe to round up some townsfolk that it may want to recruit to attack the party. But that's entirely up to you if you want to kind of add more to it, make it a, more, a little more interesting, a little more difficult, having townsfolk get hit by this malevolent presence and then join in on the, on the encounter. But it's really not needed. And that's it for Destruction's Light. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, you know how YouTube works. Hit those buttons, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you want to see covered next. And if you want to join this D&D community, make sure you join the Discord, link in the description. Come by, ask questions, let me know what you think. And as always, I'll see you at sundown.